So I focused their attention first on the dispensers, then on the food in the dispensers, then on what I was doing with the food, then on my intentions with the food, and then on things like the refrigerator where all the food was. And I would say, oh, I'm going to get an M&M, so I'm focusing their attention on the lexagram before I actually get an M&M. And then I go to the refrigerator like, do, do you really want an M&M? I'm opening the door. Would you like to pass for an M&M? And they go, oh, M&M. And I'm, oh, M&M, that's what you wanted me to get out of here. I forgot. You know, I couldn't really see. Oh, I see now. It's, and so I'd get that. So I... And I taught the other people in the lab how to do the similar kinds of things. So these symbols began to establish patterns of communication, uh -huh. nonverbal communication between us. And I wanted that to be both ways, not just you see it and you ask for something. But what if I need an M&M? I get hungry. I'm looking at the M&M. Can you see what I'm looking at and pick it up? and give it to me, mm -hmm. because language is two-way street. What do, good does it do? And that, that's the kind of thing I had trouble with with Lana. She knows all these words, but I, I don't know how to use them with her. Tim, Tim seemed to know how to use them with her, but they had something that I didn't know how to fit myself into. It seemed like it was nonverbal and really working for Lana, but it had been so exclusively Tim and Lana, and so exclusively how they use their symbol system is kind of like twin language or something. It's, uh -huh. it, I didn't know how to interpose myself into it. And Tim didn't have, it was all about what Tim eventually through dialogue could get Lana to achieve. Lana wasn't intentionally trying to get Tim to achieve things, but if she didn't get Tim to at least load the dispenser, she couldn't ask for the food. So she did learn to get Tim to do things. I was reaching for that from the earliest single word phase. If I'm going to give you food, then I ought to be able to invert this paradigm and put all these foods out here, and I can use the keyboard, and you can give me a food, and I'll eat it, and I'll be happy. Hmm. And that was very difficult. Initially, there was zero comprehension that this paradigm could be inverted and that I could want the food. And your job was not to look through all these symbols, but to look through all these foods that you really wanted to eat and not eat one of them. And then look at what I said. And even though you wanted to eat every one, you couldn't. You had to look and see what I said and pick it up and give it to me and I was going to eat it. And then we would take turns doing that. And those were Sue's rules. So it took a, a long time for them to inhibit the behavior of just wanting to eat the food. And then it took another amount of time for them to realize that when I hit a symbol, I was making a statement about something I cared about. I wasn't, my whole role wasn't just to be there to get them to use language. Mm -hmm. They were, needed to use language with me. Mm -hmm. And so I had to do things like go, oh, 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 and point at the food like, <laughs> and when they finally like, she really does want to eat that food. Mm -hmm. And she really is hitting the symbol, you know. And they would start to to do that. So figuring out what you wanted as opposed to just what they needed to do in order to get a reward or something yeah, like that. Because yeah, because when I first taught them how to yeah. ask for all the foods, I put them yeah. in a room together with foods between them to see if they could use their language with each other. Nobody had ever done that. Roger had tried with Bowie and Bruno to get them to sign tickle or chase with each other, but all they had to do was to do a play face and then they start tickling. Uh -huh. You know, then Roger would make them sign tickle. It, it, was not, it was redundant. They weren't really communicating the information. So I wanted to see if Sherman and Austin, since they passed all of the gardener's tests and they could name all of these foods, could they use it with each other? Which was a question you couldn't ask with Lana. You couldn't ask it with Washoe. So, so you have a speaker and a listener in language. Can you use both of these things? If you learn, psychologists at that time thought if a child had a word in the vocabulary, it meant they understood the word as well as produced the word. And they weren't really testing for understanding. So the first people working with apes didn't think they needed to under, test for understanding. If they could produce it, of course they understood it. So I tested Sherman and Austin for understanding, and they had 
no joint regard, no understanding, no, no nothing. They just ate the food. <laughs> so I, I worked on getting that receptive competency of language in place, and it meant a lot of understanding of nonverbal signals and a good nonverbal relationship. Once they had this ability to go back and forth and ask each other for foods, we set up a little table with lots of foods on it. Two pieces of raisin, two pieces of m and two pieces of orange, two pieces of apple, and one of them sat right next to the keyboard, and the other one sat on the other side. So there was always a listener and a speaker. And the speaker's role was to say, oh, I'd like some water. And the listener's role was to pick up two glasses of water and give himself one and the other mm -hmm. ate one. And we varied the things on the table all the time. And we made some portions bigger and others smaller. So they, they, it was a kind of a situation in which they could each sit down and share food, but it differed every time. And as we let them do this, they started ad adding their own chimpanzee gestures and vocalizations and coordination that was it became very high level I still have not analyzed those tapes to show the high level of nonverbal coordination that went into this food sharing 